Funding for About Blood, Sickle Cell Anemia comes from the Dr. Donald J. Goodman and Ruth Weber Goodman Philanthropic Fund of the Cleveland Foundation, the Margaret Clark Morgan Foundation, the McGregor Foundation, the Woodruff Foundation, and the Community Foundation of Lorain County. It's a chronic, debilitating disease. Most people know little about sickle cell anemia, an inherited blood disease passed on from parents to babies. It affects the African American community, but we know nothing about it. Learn the importance of testing, explore treatments, and understand hardships. Because this is such a glaring healthcare disparity, we as a society should be ashamed. Follow one man's struggle. It can take you out. It can, it, can, it can take you out. It can make you want to take yourself out. Now, sickle cell anemia, a tale about blood. Oh, oh, like oh, oh. While he may look okay to the eye, 25-year-old Arthur Brown lives with extreme pain, frequent hospitalizations, and major complications. Brown has sickle cell anemia. Take some deep breaths. It's a chronic, debilitating disease that can affect a patient in every aspect of their life, physical, psychological, social. I don't think God gives anybody more that they can handle. So, um, I mean, I feel like, you know, if he, he gave it to me because he knew I could handle it. Mm -hmm. I love you. I do admire Arthur with him going through sickle cell. He's always so happy, like he loves life and he doesn't get upset about the little things like a lot of us do. He's like the least selfish person I know. He just likes to help people. Sickle cell anemia is an inherited blood disease that affects millions of people worldwide from various races and cultures. About 100,000 Americans have it. Most of them are African Americans. Sickle cell disease comes in different forms. Arthur Brown has one of the most severe types. The worst part involves intense pain attacks that send him to the emergency room. When it's at its worst, it's, it's really intense. I would describe it as maybe just somebody just repeatedly hitting you with a sledgehammer. What exactly is happening in Arthur Brown's blood that's causing all the pain and suffering? To answer that question, we talk to several experts and take a trip from the lab to an unconventional classroom. Think of this hallway as an artery with blood flowing through it. The rooms along it, like this kitchenette, represent capillaries, tiny vessels that stretch into the most remote locations of the body. Now, blood is comprised of lots of different stuff. We're going to focus on three of the most important things. Let's start with white blood cells. Their job is to fight infections and disease. The white blood cells function is to be the main defender of the body to foreign invaders. So it basically is the army patrolling around the bloodstream to sniff out any bad infiltrators that are trying to attack. Any bad guys? Any bad guys. Next come the platelets. They're the fix-it guys that plug up leaks in vessel walls. They patch up little breaks and cracks in the blood vessel wall to prevent one from essentially bleeding to death. Last, but certainly not least, there are the red blood cells that carry oxygen. Healthy red cells are bendable, allowing them to glide easily through the tiny capillaries, delivering oxygen to every nook and cranny of the body. So the red cell is sort of floating along and it's, it's flexible, it can wriggle and it can squeeze its way through the tiniest little blood vessels and in your toe and in your brain. The red cell is wriggling its way because it's flexible like a water balloon. In sickle cell anemia, the problem is not with the white blood cells or the platelets. The problem is with the red cells. They're abnormal with a crescent shape. They're clumsy, stiff, and cannot traverse and bend into the capillaries. They stick together and pile up, preventing oxygen from getting to the cells and tissues. So that curved red cell that we see spells big time trouble for the body. 
That's correct, and that leads to a whole cascade of events. Eventually leads to trouble for the patient where they can't oxygenate their tissues. Sickle cell anemia can literally affect every organ in the body. While symptoms vary from patient to patient, the sickest patients are at risk for a myriad of life-threatening problems, including breathing troubles and stroke. On average, they only survive into their mid-40s. Their lifespan is definitely cut in half. Not only their quantity of life, but their quality of life is dramatically impaired. Very often, by the time they hit their mid-20s, they are medically disabled. I'm going to take a listen to your lungs. The pain attacks patients suffer can occur up to five or six times a year. In March 2012, Arthur Brown was back in the hospital with another attack. I mean, I, I don't really know how to describe it, except uh, it's horrible. It's difficult to watch him in so much pain because there's not much I can do to help his pain besides just, you know, just talk to him and try and comfort him. It's draining on your family, having to come up here all the time to see you. Like, oh man, Arthur's in the hospital again. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye, love you. Love you I'll too. see you later. Sickle cell anemia has haunted Arthur Brown his whole life. I've been to the point where I've tried to kill myself. I've been there. I've been there once. As we're about to see, growing up with sickle cell anemia can be a harrowing experience. Kids are supposed to go to school. They're supposed to play with their friends, ride their bikes, and many times our kids can't do that because they're in the hospital in pain. Sickle cell story begins with this. Tiny drops of blood that reveal a problem with hemoglobin, a protein inside red blood cells that carries oxygen. Every cell in our bodies, you know, every skin cell, kidney cell, brain cell, every cell needs oxygen, and every one of those cells gets their oxygen from hemoglobin. If you mess with hemoglobin, you mess with every cell in the body. In healthy round red blood cells, hemoglobin is widely dispersed. But in sickle cell anemia, the hemoglobin clumps together, eventually stretching and misshaping the cell, which can lead to pileups in the bloodstream. Hemoglobin abnormalities are inherited. They arise from a mistake of sorts in the body's genetic code passed on from parents to children. One letter in the genetic code is changed. This changes this hemoglobin molecule but because hemoglobin is so important, carries and delivers oxygen to every cell in the body, the whole body gets affected. These hemoglobin defects appeared for a reason. They're a product of evolution, a way for the body to ward off another deadly disease. In parts of the world where malaria is endemic, having a, a, a gene or a, a genetic code that has this change actually protects against malaria. In particular, it protects against a very deadly form of malaria that affects the brain. And that's why these abnormalities exist. And that's why sickle cell disease is found most often in Africa, but also in the Mediterranean, Latin America, the Caribbean, India, and the Middle East. Here in the United States, an estimated two million people whose ancestors come from those parts of the world have the sickle cell trait. About 100,000 Americans have the full-blown disease. Most of them are African Americans. About one in 10 African American babies is born with the sickle cell trait. About one in 500 actually has the disease. People who have trait, so-called carriers, usually don't get sick. They don't develop the disease, but they can pass the disease on to their children. When a child is born, half of their DNA, half of their genetic information comes from their mom, and half of their genetic information comes from their dad. And so if each parent carries sickle cell trait, which means they would have one abnormal hemoglobin, then they have a 25% chance of having a child with sickle cell disease. The problem is many people who carry the trait don't know they have it. If they didn't know that they had the trait or they forgot they had the trait and then they go to get married and then they marry someone who has a trait, then they're having children with sickle cell. So I don't think it gets the attention 
that it should in our community. Ohio, along with most other states, requires newborn screening for sickle cell. This didn't start until 1990. People born before that may not have been tested. There's a simple blood test adults can have to determine if they carry the trait, but lots of people don't know about it. Genetic counselor Leslie Carter advises couples to find out their trait status before they have children. So if both partners are carriers, they can be counseled about the risk. We want to make sure that people can make educated decisions. So knowledge is power. And while we are not advising them not to have children, we do want them to know the risks involved. She has tested positive, apparently, for sickle cell disease. Unfortunately, many couples only find out they are both carriers after they have a baby. I knew I had the trait, but I didn't know her dad has had the trait. So when she came out with the disease, it was just like, oh my God, I did something wrong. It's something that can be worked with, I'm saying. We just gotta just educate ourselves on what's, what's going on, I'm saying, and what we're dealing with. 25 years ago, Arthur Brown's mother found out she had the trait while she was pregnant and she didn't know his father had it. At the same time she welcomed her new baby boy into the world, she was also reeling from the diagnosis. Numb, just numb. Um, it was hard to deal with, hard to cope with. I was hurt, I was angry, I was mad, you know. In the years that followed, Quavanda Brown relied on faith to carry her through lots of sleepless nights. From the time you find out as he gets older, more and more events, more and more wild rides that you find yourself going on to, that you have to, not because you want to go, but they're just happening. It was on the playground in elementary school that Arthur Brown started to realize the extent of his illness. You can't keep up with your, with your peer, and you know, it makes you feel bad. Like, or can I keep up and do everything else that my friends are doing? And I wanted to play football, my mom wanted me to play because the doctor said I couldn't play. And I still think to this day I could have been a heck of a cornerback. Brown did find an alternative sport. You played high school basketball with sickle cell. How hard was that? It was pretty grueling. You know, to be on the court, you know, everybody else was in you know, tip top condition. And uh, me having to push myself, it was, it was pretty rough on the body. Did it help you realize how strong you are, both physically and mentally? Definitely. Physically, you know, let me know my limits. Uh, mentally, you know, let me know how, how hard I, I can push myself. Both on the court and off, Brown developed a fighting spirit against sickle cell anemia. He was a lot of the reason that kept me strong because I would look at him and see he was so determined he would keep going. He wouldn't, he didn't let it stop him, so that kept me going. Arthur Brown would need every bit of strength he could muster to survive. One, two, three, click. Mandatory screening at birth for genetic diseases like sickle cell anemia is considered one of public health's greatest victories. It's made a dramatic improvement in extending lives of children with sickle cell. About 90% now make it into adulthood. We can start this antibiotic prophylaxis, meaning we give children medicine and antibiotic medicine every day, and this has significantly reduced the death rate. While antibiotics help prevent deadly infections among young children, they don't help reduce the pain or halt the progression of the disease. To date, there is only one drug approved by the FDA to treat sickle cell anemia in children and adults. It's called hydroxyurea and helps reduce pain attacks and other symptoms, but it doesn't work for everyone. Several new medicines to reduce symptoms are in development. Dr. Yogan Santararaja heads a team for one that's just beginning clinical trials in humans. Currently, the only way to cure sickle cell anemia is with a bone marrow transplant a procedure in which bone marrow is removed from a donor, processed, and then infused into the patient, basically giving the recipient a new factory to make healthy red blood cells. But transplants remain expensive, risky, and not widely available. And for many patients, it's hard to find suitable donors. So for the time being, lots of patients of all ages 
have to learn to live with the disease, to live with periodic episodes of severe pain. At age 16, while he was in high school, it would be pain that would drive Arthur Brown to the brink. The ordeal began in the morning with a bottle of Vicodin. One morning, I, I was supposed to go to school. I didn't. I, uh, I had some Vicodin, and I took 15 to 16, because I, I just can't take it anymore. I said, I'm done. I'm done with this. I can't take it. I just threw my hands up, and I, I, tried, I tried to kill myself. My mom got home, and like eight hours later, found an empty bottle next to me. It made me stand up, splash, just a bucket of cold water on me, and, and just was hitting me, and oh my gosh, why would you do that to me? What, what would I ever do without you? So many times, I thought I would lose him when this was it, but God was letting me know that he had everything under control, so I had to trust God, you know. Even if it gets that bad, I can't. My mom, my mom needs me, man, and my family, so. I gotta, I gotta try to be here as long as I can. Not long after graduating from high school, Arthur Brown faced another risk that comes with sickle cell anemia. So I was uh, getting out of the car, and uh, I just felt, you know, my right side go completely numb, and I, I fell to the ground, and and I guess I passed out, and uh, I, I had to go to the hospital by EMS, and that's when I, that's when I found out I had a stroke. What happens is those abnormal red blood cells stick together everywhere in the body. In the brain, this can become a serious problem. They cause a lack of oxygen in the brain, and that can lead to stroke. Stroke was a leading cause of death for children with sickle cell until the 1990s, when doctors started using ultrasound technology to identify those most at risk. Such children now start receiving regular blood transfusions, which has cut the risk of stroke by 80%. And I'm gonna ask you to mask. Adults like Arthur Brown, who have already had strokes, as well as high-risk children, usually need monthly blood transfusions. Brown O positive, this is O negative. During the procedure, Brown's sickled cells will be removed and replaced with healthy red cells donated by people at blood drives. There's 10 bags. These are the red blood cells that we're going to be giving to Arthur today. That's the whole premise of this whole treatment, is out with the old and in with the new. This right here, this is the donor bloodline, and it's going into the right chest port for Arthur. This line here is taking the disease cells out. Within five minutes, Brown is halfway through bag one, with new bags on the way. There are several potential risks with transfusion. For example, if patients get blood that is not a proper match, they are at risk for rejecting the blood. Blood collected during blood drives is matched from donor to recipient based on blood type. But red blood cells also have other minor protein markers on them, which can make them incompatible between donor and recipient. People of the same race or ethnicity tend to have the same minor markers, which is why it's important for more African Americans to donate blood. A unit coming from one African American to another is statistically a little bit less likely to have this sort of minor incompatibility. So it is important. We do need more minority representation in our donor pool. What do you consider the people that donate? How would you categorize them? Well, they're definitely heroes. They're not just my heroes. Um, heroes are anybody who requires blood. You know, any type of anemics or. Uh, anybody who, you know, may require a blood transfusion, you know, from a trauma, from loss of blood, just, they help out a lot of people. How are you feeling, Arthur? Uh, good. In this session, all goes well. But as we're about to see, young adults like Arthur Brown often have trouble getting the care they need. Many say it's time to raise awareness and make noise. I think patients with sickle cell disease, you know, are not being heard and sometimes they're yelling and they're still not being heard. And I think it really is up to us as the, as the medical professionals, as doctors, as nurses, as scientists, as researchers to be that voice. It just needs to be more education as far as um, in the community as well as the hospitals because people really just don't know or understand and they're, they're really ignorant to it.
On the heels of the civil rights movement in 1971, President Richard Nixon proposed a five-fold increase in federal spending for sickle cell research. Forty years and a billion dollars later, a lot has been accomplished, especially for children. Those who typically died by age 14 now live into their 40s and beyond. Community outreach, screening, genetic counseling, and treatments to manage complications have all expanded. But many physicians remain frustrated that more hasn't been done. For starters, there's only one FDA-approved drug. You know, we're living in the 21st century, and yet in the last 100 plus years since we've known about sickle cell disease, we have one medicine. So what does that tell you? That tells me that this healthcare disparity needs to stop. Money is a big part of the problem. An article six years ago in the journal Pediatrics has become a springboard of discussion about inequities. It compared funding levels by NIH, the government's main funder of medical research, between sickle cell disease and cystic fibrosis in 2004. Both are serious genetic diseases associated with shortened lifespans. Sickle cell disease, by some estimates, affects as many as 100,000 Americans, while cystic fibrosis affects about 30,000. Yet cystic fibrosis got more funding, four times more on a per-person basis. The inequity has continued. Sickle cell disease is the most common genetic disorder in the United States, and yet the amount of support that uh, sickle cell disease gets um, is significantly less um, than other genetic disorders uh, that are much, much less common. In the fierce competition for research funding, advocates for many conditions feel shortchanged. It often comes down to who has the best organization and clout. Many patients with sickle cell are poor, minorities, and lack influence. Because of socioeconomics, the lobby uh, that, that advocates for research, for progress, is not a strong one. And this also has a major impact on funding levels. Uh, so there's, there's clearly, without doubt, there is a socioeconomic aspect to sickle cell disease. The article in Pediatrics also examines the role of race, stating, quote, as a country, we continue to struggle with the implication of past and present racial bias for health. Besides inequity in funding, there are problems delivering care to sickle cell patients, particularly young adults. There's a shortage of sickle cell specialists. Ongoing treatment is often fragmented. The healthcare system is hard to navigate and many lack insurance. One consequence of all this is that many patients do not seek medical attention until they're in dire straits. They head to the emergency room in search of narcotics for pain. Pain that can be as severe as that of a broken bone, but not as obvious. It can be a confusing situation for medical staff and result in undertreatment. One of the things that doctors and nurses are looking for are patients to demonstrate pain behaviors that's appropriate for the amount of pain they're having. Somebody that's grown up with pain their entire life has learned to compensate for that pain, and so typically they will not show those kinds of pain behaviors. On top of all these challenges, there are communication problems caused by differences in race and or culture. To stay out of these emergency room scenarios, sickle cell patients need quality ongoing care. But in 2010, Arthur Brown found himself missing just that. He became unemployed, lost his health insurance, stopped going for his monthly blood transfusions, and became deathly ill with pneumonia. Brown ended up in Akron General's intensive care unit on a ventilator in a medically induced coma, fighting for his life. Would he wake up? You know, I was worried about being in like that, would he wake up? Would they be able to bring him out of it? That's the moment like when I actually realized how much I really did love him. And I, um, I just wanted to be with him no matter what. So I was there for him. And I came off the ventilator and I was like, well, I mean, that was pretty much it right there. Like, that's the closest I've ever been to actually dying. So it's like, man, this, uh, 
I'm I'm straight. <laughs> I was like, I don't think it could get much worse. Hopefully it doesn't. But um, to me, it's like I've been there and back now. These days, Arthur Brown has a full-time job working for the Cleveland Clinic reading EKGs for heart disease patients. He feels blessed to be back on his regimen of monthly blood transfusions. His pain attacks now come less frequently, and he usually only ends up in the hospital once a year. Someday, Brown and his wife hope to have children. Chardet was tested for the sickle cell trait and came up negative. That means there's no risk that any children they have will have sickle cell anemia. I was going to listen to you. Brown hopes the next generation of children growing up with sickle cell anemia will learn from his experience, one that leaves him able to call the disease both a curse and a gift. All the sickness, and the weakness, the fatigue, but I also view it as you know, a, a gift too because it lets people see that you know, uh, you can get through things. Here's a few things to remember if you're African American or part of another population group at risk for sickle cell anemia. Know your trait status and discuss it with your partner before having children. Consider giving blood because there's need for more diversity among blood donors. And remember, sickle cell anemia is not a death sentence. Thanks to advances, many patients are now living decades longer. But there's still a lot left to be done. To learn more about sickle cell anemia, as well as other blood problems, visit our website at health.ideastream.org. There you'll find a multimedia collection of stories about blood, including a web-exclusive video about dangerous blood clots that can travel to the lungs, causing sudden death. View special content provided by our partner, Net Wellness, a consumer health website offered as a public service from Case Western Reserve University, the University of Cincinnati, and The Ohio State University. Go to health.ideastream.org for About Blood, a collection of radio, web, and television resources. Funding for About Blood, Sickle Cell Anemia comes from the Dr. Donald J. Goodman and Ruth Weber Goodman Philanthropic Fund of the Cleveland Foundation, the Margaret Clark Morgan Foundation, the McGregor Foundation, the Woodruff Foundation, and the Community Foundation of Lorain County. Coming up next, Rembrandt in America. At 9, Prohibition, a nation of scofflaws. Ends at 11 BBC World News. All tonight on member-supported WVIZ PBS. The 9th Annual Lorain County Arthritis Expo takes place Wednesday, May 23rd from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the 